Hello all, this is Dr. Dave Mastak. I'm talking about reciprocity.com, the sharing economy proofreading platform that I am trying to build. The E is spelt with a three. And in this particular video, I really wanted to talk about different threats to internal validity, specifically regression to the means. So this is my Nerd Out Wednesday. This is where I put out YouTube videos every Wednesday about things that I like in science. I'm a professor of innovation strategy and entrepreneurship at a large research school. And uh, I just like talking about these different kind of sciencey things. And one of them that we are concerned about often is called regression to the mean. Um, so what I'm gonna do is get into exactly what I mean by in, uh, threat to internal validity, quickly touch on that, get into what do I mean by regression to the mean, and then finally give you a couple of examples and maybe some possible ways to actually navigate this particular problem if you are a researcher and you're thinking about the regression to the mean. So what exactly is a regression or what is what is a threat to internal validity? Well, this is based on Cook and Campbell's and Scandish's work where they talk about different threats to internal validity. And basically what that is, is if you're designing a study or if you're trying to look at the effect of A that leads to B, you want to design a research study such that um, you can conclusively suggest that A leads to B. And anything that sort of uh, makes it difficult for you to draw that conclusion is a threat to internal validity. It's a threat to that, that there is some problem with the study that you have designed that leads somebody else to believe that that is not likely the cause of that relationship, right? So we're always thinking about causal factors. It's really important to think about internal validity. Um, but I, they, we're moving away, so the scientific method is definitely moving away from correlational sort of estimates, moving towards these sort of causal seeing if we can get more causation and thinking about different ways that we can get causation in many different ways, right? So um, what is regression to the mean? Well, regression to the mean is a really interesting result when you take a study or if you measure um, different subjects or different whatever objects, whatever it is you're measuring and you measure them at the extreme and you're only capturing sort of an extreme value. Well, if you repeatedly measure that over time and you continuously measure that same thing over time, what's going to happen is it's going to move towards the central tendency of those values. So it's not going to be an extreme value when you after you measure it many, many times in a row. So it's thinking about you know, just by chance or luck, sometimes you just gather some data and you look at the data and sometimes you just get outlying events. And so it's just this this idea because of chance or luck, you're gathering the outlying events that if you gather more data, you are not going to experience nearly the, the same amount of regression to the mean. So the more data you gather, the more observations you gather, that's going to pull the, the average, the mean, towards the what the true value is, right? So if you gather one and it's at an extreme value and you take the average of that, the average of whatever you're measuring is going to be very extreme. But then if you gather, say, a thousand of those particular things, what's going to happen is it's going to regress. The average is going to regress to the mean right, is going to regress to the central tendency to where it should be in the long run. So it's this idea of looking at extreme values or looking at extremes. It's kind of a form of regression or it's a form of range restriction. So if you take a large, if you take a sample, right, or if you look at a population and you only measure a small amount of that population at ex some extreme value, then um, you are not looking at the true relationship over the entire population of what you should be looking at. You're only looking at the very extreme values. And so those values are going to be biased. They're going to be skewed in one direction, whatever it is, and you're going to get estimates. You're going to believe that the true value is way up here, but the true value is actually way down here, right? And the same goes to that direction too. Could be that it's very negative. Um, but then you, you know, over the long run, 
you find out that the average is more towards the mean. And so there's lots of different examples. I really like this. There's lots of really cool research in this area um, because we, so, so I study organizations, I study performance. Uh, there's a lot of other people that are in my field that study performance. Same with individual performance. What we often do is we look at the firms that are in, um, or the top performers, the top performing firms, right? So the Fortune 500 firms, or we look at the top performing individuals. So the extreme athletes that are out there or the best performing people in the classroom, whatever it is, we're looking at the values, we're looking at the ones that are performing the highest and we try to draw some conclusions from those that are performing the highest. So we think that if you only invest in, um, if you only invest in gold, for example, then you will get an extreme value. You make lots of money in the long run by only investing in gold. If you, um, if you study really, really hard and you study night and day, um, then you are going to be a top performer in your classroom, right? Um, if you, what else is there? If you, uh, let's say, oh, if you t take performance enhancing drugs, then you will be a top performer, top performing athlete. I'm just making that up, right? It doesn't matter. Um, but what you're neglecting, if you take the entire um, field, if you take the entire population, you measure it across the entire population, a lot of these effects might be washed out because, um, so for example, taking the performance enhancing drugs, what you also need to do is train very hard at the same time. And most people are not going to train very hard. So they might take some, maybe they take a testosterone um, treatment and they're not working out that hard and nothing happens to them, right? So they're not doing anything. And so then it's all a wash. Maybe um, you look at people that are studying uh, all the time, but they're studying ineffectively. So they're like chatting on the phone or they're in front of their computer or whatnot. It might look like they're putting in all these hours, but their performance is not going to be all that high. So you're only taking before what you're taking is the top performers and you're looking at how long they studied or how hard they studied. That's because they had the study skills. They understood how to do that to actually perform really, really well. They also had the cognitive ability. They were able to think through things. They had the intelligence, for example, to think, think through things to get to that higher ability. So you often neglect these other factors when you just look at the out the extreme performance or extreme outliers. You often neglect all these other factors that allow you to get to that extreme because you just don't observe those in the in your sample, right? Because you're removing all the things, all the other factors that get you to that performance, right? So it's something that we are very very concerned with. And the really th neat thing is, and what's really cool, is often we learn from extreme events, right? That's how we're trained to learn as human beings. We learn from um, successes and we learn from failures in the long run. It's called reinforcement learning. And we try to generalize from maybe a disaster. We try to learn from a disaster or a catastrophe. And we maybe try to learn from riches, for example, or great fortunes that somebody has. And we try to make these lessons. But when we're, when we're doing that, we're getting very extreme values and we're not actually doing a very good job of learning how to actually get to that, that value. Because a lot of times you might get things like luck, for example, that drive you to these extreme values. There might be some catastrophe, some lucky thing that leads you to a catastrophe, some bad luck thing that leads you to a catastrophe. Might be some very fortunate thing that leads you to good luck. I Maybe mean, meet the right person, for example, and you get put in the right contacts and all of a sudden something takes off and you make lots of money, right? What you should be thinking about with a regression to the mean is all the other people, the entire sample and how they actually sort of move up and move the entire sample up, not just the entire population, not just the little wee sample that you're looking at, right? So you might want to look at a broader sample. So if you're looking at, so for example, you might look for you know, the Bill Gates, for example, the very high outlying people, right, with their wealth, and you might try to learn from them. Well, you're not going to get a lot of practical lessons from them. What you should be learning from in terms of, 
like gaining wealth and things like that is just from the average person or a huge sample of the average person. You look to see it how they're shifting. This large sample of the average population is shifting. And you know the way that you do that is put a little bit away in your 401k or your pension or whatever it is. And you know things are basic, very very basic things like that versus you know betting on something, some extreme event some extreme technology and investing in a technology and hoping that it's going to take off, right? So how do you deal with problems of regression to the mean within a study that you're conducting? The best way I think to do it is make sure that you have a very large range of observations and try to collect as many observations as you possibly can from as diverse of a population as you possibly can. The other way that you can think about this is you change the population that you're generalizing to, right? So that's one really uh, interesting and important trick to sort of think about sort of scientific methodology is that you can generalize very broadly to, to sort of every phenomenon, but then you can sort of narrow it down and generalize to something that's a lot more narrower. And as long as you're very explicit and upfront about that you're generalizing to this very narrow audience, whatever it is, maybe it's, maybe it's children that you're generalizing to and your sample is children's from the age of five to seven, well, that's going to be a lot different than saying I'm going to generalize to all children from the ages of uh, 0 to 18, right? So you want to narrow it down and you just be very explicit that your population is children from the ages of 5 to 7, right? So it's essentially some sort of range restriction that is happening. And the more that you sort of gather data from a larger sort of population, the or larger the sample is is broader the more that the regression to the mean is not going to be a problem and the more observations you gather the more that the problem or that the more that you're going to reduce all issues of regression to the mean now it is kind of a form of a selection bias so you can do some sort of selection bias model after the fact so you can do maybe a Heckman selection model there are other techniques that you can look at as well I'm not going to get into all of those but one of them might be kind of like a, a rare events type model where you first predict the probability of some event happening and then you predict the within that probability of that particular thing happening or in that sample what is the likelihood of that occurring so you can use those kind of things like that, some sort of empirical technique to reduce those problems. And you could look at that in, in Stata, for example, it's a rare events logit model or a negative binomial, uh, a zero inflated negative binomial model, something like that. You can look up those and if you're interested. The other thing that you could should do is that you just have to convince the reviewers that regression to the mean is not a problem with what you're doing. So you have to sort of systematically go through and make sure that you don't have a regression to the mean problem by making sure maybe what you do is you gather another sample a few months later and you look to see if that sample has the same sort of mean tendencies as you did as it had in the other sample that you gathered. And that is a really effective way to demonstrate that you don't necessarily have a problem with regression to the mean. So that's all I really wanted to do. So in this particular video, I talked about what exactly regression to the mean is, right? And then I went into, you know, what are some examples of regression to the mean and why it's important. And then finally, I talked about different ish, different ways to sort of reduce regression to the mean or minimize the issues that you get from regression to the mean. All right, so um, with that, if you like these videos, you could check out my other Nerdo Wednesday videos. I also put out stuff for graduate students because I think a lot of graduate students will be watching these. You watch those on Fridays as well, pretty helpful stuff. And I also put out stuff for small businesses and, and as well strategy for small businesses and writers. You can look at the YouTube channel for reciprocity.com. If you want to help out, go on to the website, check it out. It's reciprocity.com, the E is spelt with a three. So that's it. Thank you so much. Have a good day and take care. Bye.